Huawei's P20 and P20 Pro have launched with notched screens, faux stereo speakers and various camera improvements including a new Leica triple camera on the Pro. The P20 has a 5.8 inch LCD with a notch and 1080p resolution plus a fingerprint reader that can double as a navigation control. Inside there's a Kirin 970 chipset with 4GB of RAM and there's 64GB of storage plus microSD or a second SIM. The P20's camera is 1 over 2.3 inch 12 megapixels with OIS and an f over 1.6 lens plus a 20 megapixel monochrome sensor. The P20 Pro is the interesting one, slightly bigger with a 6.1 inch screen but is AMOLED. Other specs are the same apart from the camera arrangement. Helped by one of Nokia's PureView creators, Eero Salmelin, there's a 1 over 1.7 inch 40 megapixel sensor that combines with an 8 megapixel telephoto lens to deliver effective 5 times hybrid zoom that looks impressive, especially from a phone this thin. The P20 Pro also has a large 4000 mAh battery and is IP67 rated. What hasn't it got? A headphone jack, which I still think is a mistake in the Android world. In the last phone show, amidst much adulation of the super hardware in this, the Galaxy S9, no compromises, everything from dual aperture camera to Qi charging to headphone jack, I put across some pointed digs at some of the Samsung experience, as it's called by the company itself, duplicate apps, services you can't turn off, Bixby and so on. Yet the terrific phone hardware overall has caused me to persevere. And given that the software here is extremely similar to that on the Galaxy S8, S8 Plus, Note 8, and of course the sister device, the S9 Plus, not to mention a Galaxy of lower priced Samsung offerings, see what I did there? I thought it might be very useful to point out the things that you definitely want to get rid of and five things you probably want to keep around since they're a genuine step up from plain Android, as on the Pixel range. Here we go then. Everyone's use case is slightly different, but hopefully anyone within range of a newish Samsung phone can get something from my lists and my breakdowns. First and easiest five things to get rid of. Number one, Bixby. This has been savaged by all and sundry since its debut on the S8 range, and you're perhaps now expecting me to swing things round, maybe champion it. No, it really is that superfluous. In day-to-day -day use, the Bixby key, the extra home screen, the voice activation, even the Bixby Vision camera mode. You don't have much choice in it set up, but once in place and your phone is, well, all set up, there are some toggles that need to be turned off, as shown here. Yes, it's a bit of a waste of a good hardware button. Maybe Samsung will let us change its function in a future update. I haven't found out how to disable the Bixby Vision control in the Samsung camera yet, but maybe this will come in useful one day since its image recognition system occasionally gets things right. And from shopping to QR codes, this could yet prove itself. Number two, Facebook. My S9 came with the full Facebook client installed. It's not only a monster in terms of resources and data use, but recent news events have made everyone all the more distrustful of what Facebook does. So if you need to stay in touch with friends and family using this service, then I'd recommend the ultra small Facebook Lite client, L-I-T-E, you'll find it in the Play Store. It's official and yet unobtrusive. The full Facebook client can't be uninstalled, but you can disable it in settings and then its icon will vanish from your app drawer. Number three, Samsung's time and weather widget. Now this is a subjective thing, obviously, but the default Samsung home screen widget is enormous in terms of screen layout, but with comparatively little information contained. It's, it's just a standard Android widget though, so long press it and quote, remove from home screen and put in your own favored widgets as needed. And while you're there, you can also increase the available space by playing with the home screen spacing. Long press on a blank area, and choose home screen settings and then on home screen grid. I settled on five by six, which gave me an extra half dozen or so icon or folder positions. Number four, advanced features. Now Samsung has historically loved putting in extra gestures and actions throughout the interface of its Galaxy phones. But unless you're really steeped in Samsung law, then you won't remember them. And I suspect having all the defaults on means extra battery drain. So head into settings, advanced features, and probably turn everything off. Number five, camera modes. One of the core Samsung strengths has been having good cameras and Samsung puts a lot of extra functions and modes into its camera interfaces. 
Now these will be slightly different depending on model, but on the new S9 range at least, most people watching this show won't be needing the teenager focused AR emoji mode and probably not food mode or selective focus, which is a bit of a fudge, or hyperlapse or even super slow-mo after the initial playtime and novelty. Happily, in the camera app in settings, there's an edit camera modes feature and you can select which ones you want to be available for swiping through. So in my case, I've got auto, then pro, then panorama, for example, but it's up to you and note that you can also reorder them at the same time by dragging and dropping. So you can minimize the swipes needed when you've opened the Samsung camera by uh, double tapping the power button. Of course, this works really well on most recent Samsungs. But lest you think that much of what Samsung has put in has been rejected here by me, there's also a lot that's been added to Android that's worthwhile. Number one, themes. I've long been a fan of themes on phones, right back to the days of Symbian and S60 smartphones in 2006. Keep your phone feeling fresh every week, right down to icons, animations and sound schemes, but mainly because Samsung defaults a lot of its interfaces to white and bright, which is very unfriendly to AMOLED screen phones in terms of power drain. So have a browse through some of the dark themes in settings, wallpapers and themes. I settled on Material Dark Android 7 Plus, which worked perfectly for me, taking me closer to what I used to see on a Nexus device and also making a lot of settings and configuration screens in the interface look, well, very battery friendly. Number two, notification gesture. Now I mentioned home screen settings just now, and also on that settings pane is quick open notification panel, meaning that you can swipe down from anywhere on a home screen to show your notifications pane, rather than having to stretch your thumb right up to the very top to start the swipe. Hugely useful, especially paired with the pixel-like swipe up to show the application draw. The best of both worlds. Number three, edge screens. I turned this off initially as part of my earlier setup, but it turns out this is a really nice way into certain areas of the phone. Now, more app shortcuts we don't need, but it turns out that having all my family one swipe away is a really, really nice touch and saves having to massage them into home screen shortcuts. And I have Smart Select and Clipboard Edge there too for a very quick way into Samsung's proprietary selection tools and the multi-clipboard. When doing something complicated, in my case, writing a news story on the go, perhaps with my Bluetooth keyboard, all this selection and clipboard functionality is a lifesaver. Number four, applications. It's all very well me complaining that there are some duplicate applications, but this really shouldn't necessarily be a bad thing since after much playing around, I've settled on Samsung's clock, contacts and phone as being better than their Google counterparts, not least because they're all dark themed again. Got to save those milliamp hours. Plus Samsung's music player, it just works and doesn't keep pestering me to join a subscription streaming service unlike Google Play Music. In short, I've now got a mix of Google and Samsung applications, but it all works for me. I did draw the line at Samsung Pay though. In the UK, Google Pay works everywhere, though I dare say the MTS, the mag stripe emulating Samsung Pay might be needed in developing countries. Number five, the Samsung auto vanishing navigation controls. It only takes a fraction of a second to do and does mean my screen shows an extra centimeter of content in most applications most of the time. And there are useful extras like the Dolby Atmos and the Samsung Video Enhancer, which I really find very helpful. However, most of this is generic. It's not just about the new Galaxy S9 range. It's also applicable to anyone picking up a bargain S8 or S8 Plus, maybe the Note 8, all of which are now available at bargain prices on clearance or secondhand, perhaps saving £300 on the as new prices in each case. As a three weeks on postscript to my Galaxy S9 review, I don't regret buying it or recommending it in the slightest. The Huawei P20 Pro mentioned in the news still might have a better camera. Other phones might have faster processors, more RAM and so on through the year. But the S9 and the S9 Plus will remain the benchmark flagships for everything else to be compared to, in my opinion, for the whole of 2018. Oh, and if you're wondering about this case, I even forgot it was on. This is the Spigen Slim Armour. Highly recommended. I'll put a link in the show notes.